Hi everybody and welcome to another episode in a day of the fu- in the future. Today we have the pleasure of talking with uh, Raul Popa. Uh, he's co-founded multiple startups and helped launch several innovative software pro- products in the past. Uh, he has 20 plus years of ex- experience in software development, product management and business management. He's also a Techstars alumni and a Mensa member. And uh, his latest project and product that he's currently focusing on is Typing DNA, a revolutionary tech company that recognizes people by the way they type on computers and mobile devices using typing biometrics. It is one of the most promising tech startups in Romania, and it is currently based in New York. It has been featured in TechCrunch, Forbes, Product Hunt, and many other similar publications. And uh, I have the great pleasure of discussing about how future of work is changing the way people trust each other. Uh, welcome, Raul, and it's a great pleasure to discuss with you today. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, yeah, happy to happy to be here. Well, happy to discuss with you again. Like the the last time we met in Brooklyn, I I really had the the great opportunity of understanding the vibe and what that place has grown into due to you. So I just want to thank you for that. And it's awesome that we can have that uh, this conversation uh, today. So if let's start with uh, the first question that can get us straight into the subject. What's a good example of current trends that is affecting trust? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, trust is... Uh... It's an important topic in cybersecurity, um, and uh, it's uh, not only in cybersecurity. Generally, in business, in business, uh, in any any parts of the business, basically, you cannot really do business unless you trust each other, unless you trust everything from, you know, the supplier, the employees, the client, the distributors, and every everyone has to trust everyone else of course there's also sort of like legal warranties and guarantees in place to help make everything happen but without trust we would be nowhere right and uh in cybersecurity, trust has a different a little bit of different um sort of um you know color mm-hmm. um the thing is um there's there's many many hackers out there there's many uh, ways in which um, these hackers, you know, get uh, access to on on, com- on computers, uh, you know, install viruses, ransomware, um, do phishing attacks, so so many things like that. And with uh, as a new trend, what is I think very very important to understand is the, um, you know, the difference between when everybody was working, you know, from company premises before the pandemic, pretty much that was the norm. So when everybody was working from the company premises and uh, you don't, you didn't need to trust, you know, user that much, as mm-hmm. long as they were in the office working on their, on their computers, you know, respecting protocol and all that. Now they're moving outside of company premise and it's much easier for them to be neglect, uh, negligent, to, you know, allow other people to use their computers, to click on the wrong links, to, you know, sometimes you don't you don't control. They can be drunk at home, you know, uh, working, or they can be not working at all and just uh, leaving the computers unattended. You know, with a mouse jiggler or some sort of uh, thing that would just s- simulate that they're working, they're not, and you know, allowing the computer to be, um, you know, hacked by other people in many many ways and so forth. So trust, all of a sudden, um, you know, became an issue once employees left the company premise and it's not only for company x it's for their vendors for their distributors for their everybody freelancers whatever companies they work with for any single aspect of the of the work and it's really like um i just uh, i just recently just heard um a in another podcast actually <laughs> there was one uh telling uh the story of a guy named john who uh, they hired during the pandemic based on interview that they did and all that. And uh, this John started working with them, right? And at some point they decided to, 
to meet in the office and the guy who showed up didn't really look and act like John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, trust goes much, much deeper than that. It's not only that you can trust or not the actual people that you hire. You don't even know if they're the actual people that you hire. So, and this will affect, and I think this affects everything at this point. Imagine there's so many companies dealing with all this like customer data, private data, um, you know, they work with government, maybe with bigger companies, they work with airline, with energy providers, so forth. So there's so many things um, waiting to happen that could damage our entire, the entire thing and could compromise, you know, anything from the energy sector to travel, to accommodation, to, you know, banking and so forth. So um, everything relies on trust and trust is now disrupted by this work from home um, thing. And that's where we as a company try to fix things. And there's a number of others that are trying to do that. But we can maybe talk a little bit about that uh, a little uh, later. I hope this uh, response kind of covered a little bit what you wanted. Yeah, it, it did. It did. But so I'm curious, how then did the pandemic affect uh, Typing DNA's uh, plans activity? Like, did Typing DNA came uh, after the pandemic started or it was already running for a while and for how mo how long so typing dna is the typing biometrics company we started with research around typing biometrics trying to mm -hmm. figure out how, uh, whether we can use the way people type for different things not just only authentication not just only you know um, keeping unauthorized users out of a company computers and things like that basically we thought okay so the way you type is unique right and the fact is unique. Well, there's a number of unique things about people, like fingerprints, like voice, like um, you know their face and so forth. And 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 now you know these are ob obviously very often or uh, DNA and so forth. Obviously, these are used a lot of time for authentication uh, in different aspects, different types of authentication, right? Um, and we thought, you know, this. Might, I mean, it's normal. This. Uh, should be used as authentication because it's a biometric and why not and then we realize hey you actually don't need any external hardware you don't need any you know can work on any computer even on mobile phones or anything that has a, any sort of uh, keyboard input even a touch input um yeah could you know in theory it could work even in the metaverse as long as you have a keyboard somewhere that you you operate in a way or another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can you can uh, record typing biometrics. So the 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 way you actually press the keys, how long you press the keys, and so forth on mobile devices. Also, how you tilt the phones while you while you press each key and so forth. And so we were we were thinking of that, but then a lot of other uh, ideas came along. Like, uh, for example, from voice, you can uh, you can make predictions about about uh, people's age, like gen uh, gender, um, maybe uh, race. Things like that. Um, and the thing is, um, that th th some of them, but you know, there's there's already applications that are using voice to when, for example, you're talking with like a support, uh, you know, guy somewhere, you know, or sales guy over phone. They have now this. Um, there's and there's many companies offering this already, about five or, or so. They have this um, real time analytics of your voice, and they they know that you are now stressed. You're you're being aggressive, you're being, you know, uh, happy, you're, you, you know, you want to continue the discussion, you don't want to continue and so forth. There's all, all these indicators only from the, the your voice. And you can definitely deduct, uh, deduct some things from the face as well. Things like age, race, things like that, of course, but then, and, and along with authentication, all, all that. But you can also deduct things like, hey, um, emotions. Like that person is happy, that person is angry, that person is, you know, <clears throat> curious, whatever and tired and so forth. And we thought, what if we could do that from typing? And we tried that and that, that's actually quite interesting. So for example, at, at the very beginning, we, we had a, when we started actually, before we actually had authentication, we tried to, we tried to um, um, do, um, to predict uh, things like the, the personality profile, MBTI, or um, things like intelligence the IQ of a person. And with very good accuracy, actually, we were successful, about 90%. So <clears throat> basically, if you if you type in a sample of like 300 characters, so mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit more than, than your like, what we use for authentication. But if you type in like 
two tweets or like a long tweet because the long tweet is actually 280, 280 characters, uh, 280 characters. Um, that would be enough for us to, you know, detect how intelligent you are. And that's great. That's crazy. It's re it really is like w what type of variables uh, do you take into consideration in order to assess the level of intelligence or the level of, I don't know, whatever else? So this was at the very beginning of the research and was the first research to, to tap into this area. So for example, for intelligence, what we had, uh, we had um, over 200 uh, people with certified uh, IQ, IQ measured uh, certified IQ of over 132 uh, members of Mensa, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't use exactly their IQ. We just used them as a binary classifier in the binary classifier as high IQ. And then everybody else was, you know, average IQ, whatever, unknown IQ. So it was a sort of uh, two class classifier where you only have one class labeled. Uh, that's that's used everywhere. You use a lot of in medicine, in, in cancer diagnostics, and all sorts of things like that, where you don't extremely know that a person doesn't have cancer let's say in that case but because you don't know you can use it as an as a neutral case so and then you can train something based on you know other things you have uh and those that you actually have labeled correctly so basically based on that you train a classifier that spits you know true or false high intelligence low um not high intelligence but once you have that classifier that classifier actually is a number and reach everywhere from let's say zero to 100 and um, if you have like, uh, if you're like 80 on that scale and so, uh, so um, and you know, you, you can basically do that, you know, what would be the IQ that would co correlate with that? And actually we, we, we also, you know, uh, reverse that calculation and calibrated that to actually give you the exact, almost the exact IQ plus minus, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all of these become, are becoming important. Uh, intelligence maybe you only need to assess once, but for example, happiness is something you want to assess every day or or very often. We're we're uh, wearing all sorts of like uh, uh, activity trackers and things like that. Why? Because we want to know how we're you know what's happening when we sleep, when we move, when we do all sorts of things. But nobody knows what happens when we work eight hours a day. We stay stay at a computer. We don't know uh, is is the employee happy? Is happy with this task? What about you know versus the task that he has he had a, a, a week ago or a month ago and so forth? So all these things can matter in a work, um, you know, in a work from home uh, sort of uh, a future. And um, all of this happen to be also in your in your topic of you know trust and work from home and remote you know future uh you know work sort of scenarios this is very important because you cannot trust anymore the user so you trust the metrics that you look at you know who they are how you know good they are what they do because you see the metrics you see the performance also in you know if you measure performance you see the productivity if you measure some sort of productivity met metrics you know you know maybe that's happy they're not happy they're tired they're drunk you know everything like that i mean a lot of these things can be measured through typing so Going back to your question, your question was uh, when we started this and, and, and you know, all that. So we started back then with all sorts of research. We built this authentication API, uh, which we started selling to in uh, for different One companies. One thing, sorry for but interrupting. That... How did the idea came to be? Like, what was the first moment that the idea came uh, and how did it came? Like, was it a need? Was it how, how did it came up? I, uh, I was involved in a different company uh, in an advertising sort of uh, platform where you can create you could create uh, advertisements and um, and place them online. It was called Banner, Banner Snack. Now Current Creator P, right? Yeah, yeah. Now it's called Creator P. I think they're doing quite quite well. It's one of the few Romanian companies or born in Romania. Um, actually, I think they're like US Romanian, but like um, mm -hmm. have a lot of employees in Romania and all that. And um, they're doing they're doing well and it's uh it's one of the few companies that actually you know do something on an international level uh we are actually using it at our company as well <laughs> they're yeah and i and i find out only afterwards that they're from romania and i i was really amazed <laughs> i was uh so i uh was one of the one of the first people behind uh creatopy or banner snack uh back then and um it was it was a nice experience. We actually invented something that was not didn't exist back then. There was no Canva. There was no other competitor at that point. The competitor was Adobe Photoshop and uh, Adobe Flash. Whether you wanted to do animations or like uh, you know JPEGs and GIFs uh, with for ads, 
And uh, we realized, and it was very interesting, we realized at some conference, uh, flash conference, that um, we actually had at that point a, um, a um, um, component for animation called uh, Flash App that was used by half a million users, half a million developers and designers. This is a lot because Adobe Flash in its entirety had 1.8 million um, you know, developers and users. So 1.8 million out of which 500,000, more than 500,000 was using Flash apps, uh, uh, Flash app, our animation component. So we went to this conference and talking to different people, they were all, all you know, about, you know, how, you know, amazing projects they were creating with Adobe Flash and all that. And with other, you know, tools that they had back then, this was before like the mm -hmm. HTML5 JavaScript sort of, um, you know, took off when Flash was like the king. And, um, and they all said, look, we're, uh, and we, we, we started asking them, actually, um, Gabi Jordash, who's the, who's the CEO and owner, I think, of the major, uh, most, most of the company, is um, he came up with the idea of asking people what, uh, what they use, you know, Adobe Flash for. And uh, everybody you know, said, like, 90% uh, of the time, they, they do banners. And, like, we looked at this uh, information and we thought, why not do a tool that only do banner with? Like you, don't, you don't need you can ditch Adobe Flash. You don't need the components, uh, components, the effects, and everything. You just need the application to build that. So initially, Bannerstack was actually we hacked into Flash Player. You know, created um, you know a this this ability for us to actually output Flash animated banners. That was the initial thing. Flash animated banners that looked like Apple Keynote sort of PowerPoint mm -hmm. uh, presentations, which were out of this world back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Um, so creating animations like that in, in 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 a banner ad was something new and without flash so anyone could could do that and then we made it really cheap actually free for for a number of users and actually it took a lot of time actually until it uh, it started to you know to to have um, good traction and now it's uh, obviously they do they do now gifs and html5 and javascript uh, banners and multiple size and native and whatever i mean they they're expanding and it's 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 normal to to see that in flash i don't even think that they do any flash banners now because like there's no flash now well, flash is now obsolete but um but uh that's that's uh what we were doing and at some point in this whole process uh we were thinking um and what's very cool about uh, banners at that point is that we had um both um the platform to create the ads and we had the platforms to upload the ads and monitor the campaigns in different pl platforms. So Google Double Click was then, um, you know, a number, number of them. Like the biggest, the biggest, the biggest platforms out there for um, ad campaigns, we were connected to them. That was not the most successful part of our project. But what was cool about that is that we had access to data how that those banners actually performed. So we knew the banners that we created, how they perform, and we were able to play with machine learning. Mm. And, uh, and and actually, I started playing with machine learning in many many projects of the uh, uh, in in banner snag. We actually were able to double the revenue at some point just by understanding which of the free uh, users are actually potential premium things like that. It was it was very cool cool times. These were around, around like two thousand. 13, something like that, 14, 2012. So a few years like that, uh, kind of involved in a lot of machine learning uh, and, and try to figure out things. And one of the things was, um, one of the things is that we um, we created a thing called Banner Score. It was not very, very successful. Actually, we took it off afterwards uh, after like half a year or so because uh, people didn't know how to use it. But what, what uh, that was uh, actually provided what what it provided is basically looked at what the content of a banner was in about 60 parameters from like the text the font the legibility of the text things like that mm -hmm. like the images used contrast all sorts of things colors of the buttons if they have buttons if they have exclamation marks all those things there are a lot of metrics like that and that all those put together in like machine learning and the quality of each banner was assessed by how you know well they run in the network so the the you know cost per click and based on that, we were able to, you know, derive, you know, a a prediction engine, a machine learning, uh, you know, engine, an AI, that would basically uh, be able to score any banner as you're designing it. 
based on the content and say this has larger success uh, or uh, larger chance to have a success uh, you know to run uh, in in this network or that network for this um and we'll make this amount of clicks and so forth we decided it's too many too much information we just put there a thing called banner score the higher the score better the banner and that's something completely new was not done before but while doing that, we basically did a lot of pattern uh, analysis, and I basically dig deeper into, I had a few people that um, around uh, in the team, in my team that also did machine learning, but uh, I realized that it's uh, it's something new, that nobody know how, knew how to, how to do machine learning, how to do AI and everything. So I started teaching myself AI. And going through different pattern recognition problems, different problems like that, and I stumbled upon um, keystroke dynamics. It was called then, which is what we're doing at Typing DNA, Typing Biometrics, mm -hmm. uh, as a topic. But uh, it was very at the very beginning. There were a few companies or researchers that did a lot of research around this, mostly with statistics. So machine learning was not really used, not to the level that we're using it. Um, the, the technology was not that accurate and all that, but because I was researching all these pattern recognition problems and how to solve them and different machine learning algorithms and so forth, I kind of like pieced together things and I realized nobody put those together in the way that I did. And with a little bit of time, I can actually make something work that is better than what everybody did before. So actually what I did, I, I quit Banner at some point, uh, not to start this actually, I, I just... I wanted a break mm -hmm. and I totally understand the, you know, the current like resignation, like uh, uh trend where people like think, you know, they need to, they need to take a break. I actually fantasized for more than 10 years to like take a sabbatical year, like one year do absolutely nothing. And, um, and I did that. I took the sabbatical, but uh, three days later, I, I had absolutely no intention to continue the sabbatical. So <laughs> three, started... days, three days it lasted. <laughs> yeah, so my sabbatical started in uh, uh, December uh, 2015. Actually, the when uh, New Year's Eve 2015, 2016, three days later in January, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around and do nothing. So, uh, <laughs> but I needed that reset. That's the thing. I understand the reset um, uh, motivation, why people need the reset. There is a lot of times, a lot of things like uh, just pile up and you need uh, to clear things, to clear thoughts, and then start over from like blank state. And and I needed exactly that. And um, and I totally understand why people need it. Has anything specific helped you with that? Just like, I don't know, maybe some uh, some listeners might uh, might be really curious about, okay, well, what helps you with doing that reset, especially in three days? Like... <laughs> I'm no, I'm very passionate about what I do, and it just needed to stop being passionate about what I did at, at Banner Snack mm -hmm. and not be passionate about anything else and just be on the you know inner relaxation mode, which I cannot stay too much because I'm a very active person. At least I think all the time of all, all those possibilities and things and read and, and I, I just can't just a sit down and and relax and not think of anything and eventually this was one of the things i had like a list of ideas that i wanted to do this was one of one of the things that i that i totally wanted to uh see if it's possible if things can can be done around this thing and i was like okay uh i have my my year in which i have i don't want to do anything i, I didn't want to like you know find a job or whatever i was like i have a year when i just play I play for a year and then I'll see what I do, okay, uh, professionally. So I started playing basically. That's that's what I did, and I started typing DNA as a as a hobby, as a project that uh, I wanted to do. I wanted to, I I I used to manage more people, like um, even more than now at typing DNA. So I was uh, involved in a lot of management. And um, look, it's 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 okay to manage people. It's not it's not something that I don't like. I it's it's part of every business manager. Uh, in, 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 in every business, you cannot do business, uh, uh, without the team and you, um, not, not at the high scale, you can do small scale freelancing stuff, but you want to do it like, uh, really, really well, you need more people in the team. You need to team up, you need, um, to, uh, uh you know, a team, uh, uh, when you have more people put together work much better than each of those persons, uh, individual and all that. But I needed that reset where I sit 
alone with my code and just you know go through it without uh, without the team without anyone else and just play with it and um that gives you so much joy give you gives you so much um you know clarity of mind and i was was able to dig very very deep into you know ai and things like that you know actually think through you know what can be done to actually solve this kind of problem and once i i had like first um, algorithm for this then we i put together a team um you know co-founders and, and and then a few employees and then we started doing this uh amazing amazing project called uh, or company called type dna it's amazing technology that we built so far um the, and the last one is completely out of this world compared to everything that we did before it, everything is based on how we type but we're now tapping more and more into understanding that actually there's a lot of information there's a lot of quality information there can be used in so many ways so in the same way a dog can learn you and then it protects you in the same way this for example active lock technology just learns how you type how you use the computer and then if it's anyone else using that computer and that can be a company computer right not your personal computer then that that particular account is protected and you will be kicked out if you're not the, the actual user and that user is protected that computer is protected that um that uh, uh company is protected and nobody did this before not to not to to the level we did it i mean there's definitely a few uh companies that tried something um that it's 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 a different it's a different level in my opinion i mean i mean look even if i i, I don't want to brag about hey we're the only one doing this uh if i would be happy to know that there's a few companies doing this i think it's um you don't want to be the only one doing doing something that innovative it's yeah. like at some point like people even think you know is this even possible and and you want them to you know to see that it's possible that okay this is possible then what's the best vendor to buy this from typing any well at this point we're at the point where there are a few companies trying to break the ice and they build something around this thing uh we're definitely the best in my opinion and um we have our propri proprietary technology um but uh, obviously there's uh there's room for for many other companies to succeed in the space I moved. I moved over from from what you asked, but uh, yeah, it uh, went with the flow. It's it's fine. It's really insightful. What what are the best use cases or applications currently that are providing the most valuable uh, benefits through this technology? Like what if you were to say in uh, terms that can be easily understood for for anyone. Well, first, first of all, when people work from home, uh, as as we discussed, they uh, neglect, you know, the the level of access that they have on those computers that they they use, and um, oftentimes they may allow other people in their household that can be like children, you know, significant other, you know, you name it, roommates, um, you know, depending where you are with that computer, other people can use that computer. Maybe you throw a party, you have that computer, you say, oh, I will just play music from the corporate computer. You know, doesn't doesn't hurt. But you, you know, somebody, you know, a little bit drunk, you know, decides to decides to do a prank on you and use that computer to send a few emails to some 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 wrong people in the in the in the address, in your address list. So there's many, many things that can happen once once a computer leaves the company premise and protocol says you never you should never allow you know anyone to use that computer you should never allow that computer to be uh, unlocked and unattended things like that nobody respects that and when you have thousands of it's like with the uh, seat belt you know people don't you know don't respect protocol as uh, you know if 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 nobody if if there would be no police to verify whether you have a seat belt or not probably like 10 20 percent of people would would ever wear a seatbelt and it's like like with the mask like with the face mask you've seen um uh that once the, the there's no mandate to wear a mask everybody like stop wearing mask it's not like there's there's not even like maybe five percent of people that would say look i don't care about the mandate i don't care what the government says i would just wear the you know the mask because i think it's safe no if if nobody wears it they don't, they don't want to be embarrassed and you know look like hey i'm the only one wearing the mask so we're not wearing it so the risks uh, the perceived risk actually not not that uh, valuable for people people look at you know other indicators like who else is wearing this mask okay um and 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 it's it's uh in you know way you can you can use that um 
I was curious if there are certain certain industries, you know, like certain type of companies or certain type of, uh, you know, like enterprises that benefit the most from this technology at the moment. So we can better understand, okay, who is actually benefiting the most? Yeah, so I, I, I was trying to say basically that every company that has uh, people working remotely and it doesn't have to be a large company. Okay, it doesn't have to be a company that has a thousand or ten thousand employees. It can be even a company that has twenty employees, as long as they're working with some big clients and have uh, customer data they need to protect. Maybe they have a really big portal. I think at the at the point when I think Instagram was bought by uh, Facebook, it was like if I remember correctly, it was like 10, 11 people or so behind uh, behind Instagram. It was like at least uh, or or for sure it was be below hundred. So tens maybe. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. thing is. Um, the thing is, you know, the fact you have few employees doesn't doesn't mean that the impact of your application is not huge. Can be huge. Can be you can deal with millions and millions of people. Their data is important. Their private data is important. Their conversations are important. Um, and you want to protect, you know, every computer in that case, and not computers uh, from other people uh, using them, but from everything, from phishing, from and the users need to protect themselves from phishing and things like that. They, you need to have to FA in all applications. You need to, you know, uh, make sure you have like endpoint uh, detection and response solutions um, that you use antiviruses, things like that, VPN. So for there's so many things you need to use in a zero trust uh, world where you need to verify everything all the time because you're not in a company premise anymore and everything happens through the cloud, through computers that are everywhere in the world and all that. And my parallel with the seatbelt is if you if you you know tell people train people to wear the seatbelt, they will not wear it unless you police it, and you and and you cannot police it anymore when you leave, let um, allow people to work from home. You can police it when when things are happening in the company premise. Once you you allow people to take the computers home, look you don't you don't see that I have you know what pants I'm wearing right now, right? You don't see that because it's not in the camera. It's the same yeah, thing. No, it's no. the same thing no. with employees. You don't see you don't see what they're doing at home you only see what what they allow you to see and the point is they are not respecting protocols and training and everything else and what our technology does it works like an airbag so you have the the seat belt you have the requirements you need to put it you know every time you go you know you start a car and so forth some people will not respect and you cannot control that but what you can control is to install an airbag in every, in every car and ideally, of course, you want to install an airbag on the cars that crash because that's more efficient, right? You know the cars that will crash and only install an airbag on that. But it's not possible to know which cars will crash. And uh, this is <laughs> it sounds naive, but it's correct because a lot of you talk a lot of time with uh, with uh, secure even security managers, and they tell you, oh, we only need to protect these accounts because they have access to all this data. Well, what about these others one other ones? Oh, they're low key employees. Uh, if somebody, you know, breaks into that computer, there's nothing, you know, valuable there. Okay, but imagine I have access to that computer and I write an email to in Slack or Teams or whatever application or email and send that uh, message to 10 of the most contacted people in the organization by that person. I just can look up in, in Slack and I yeah. find it, like my last 10 chats and I say, our boss, you know, name here, in, in, insert name here. Is here with me and ask me for our client list or for the password for whatever you, you know, put whatever you want there. How many of these people will comply and just give that password, whatever access that, uh, you know, that person is asking for? And, and they're like, oh, um, well, we train them not to share, you know, things like that with like, but it's the boss who's asking. <laughs> no, nobody like, you know, you know, protocol is one thing, but when the boss is asking, you know, I'm talking like how the, you know, companies in Western Europe and US work. Even if you have protocol, if like a big boss asks for something, nobody wants to lose their job. And and this happens in government, it happens everywhere. And the thing is, as much as you want to train people to be, uh, you know, you know, to verify everything themselves, they will not do it. And if like your boss asks for something, you don't want to be fired for sure. And you just comply. That's that's what happens, and, and th this is one example. But you can trick that person into thinking that you need that information to help them to whatever. To there's so many ways in which you know social engineering is such a nice 
an interesting thing. I mean, we should study it at university. You should have, you know, degrees for like social engineering. It's it's such a powerful thing that we're just, uh, you know, looking at it only from a, um, as a bad thing. It, it is bad. I mean, you use for bad. Uh, and, uh, but so is marketing, if you want, right? It, uh, in a way. Yeah, maybe just add ethical, you know, into social engineering ethical. and, and yeah. it changes yeah. a bit, you know, like how I 100% agree. So ethical social engineering, that basically is understand how, how people work and use it in an ethical way. You basically can navigate, you know, the world and, and you know, for good and do, do stuff, do good stuff. Psychologists know it, but knows it, but uh, knows how to use social engineering and hackers too. But, um, you know, not marketed sales, some, some, some. Can you tell us a bit about the concept of zero trust and uh, how is, how is that shaping currently the, the space? So when you go into, when you go into an airport, you go to fly international, right? Uh, first thing you go in, if you have a ticket and a passport, you will need, and you need to go, you know, through TSA to, to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to check, you know, whether you have guns on you, whatever you're safe to travel. Right. So that TSA check is in applications that we're using, you know, everywhere is the login. So they verify your password your uh, ticket and then they check you to make sure that you don't carry any weapons anything that could harm the airport and whatever you're doing afterwards the application if you want right and then they let you go you're free to move around in the airport right that is a contained uh premise once you leave the airport if you go out you have to go back to the to the tsa now on the computers there's no such thing. You log in the computer, but that doesn't mean that you're in the contained premise because you're not. I mean, you were when, when the, everything happened from company premises, but now it's happening from your home, from your Airbnb, from a, you know airport. It doesn't really matter. You're at the WeWork, whatever, and you're opening the computer, you log in a certain application, and that computer thinks you're safe and you can be trusted. And that's not correct. That's not true. Uh, true and zero trust says you cannot you know expect you know that once the person logs in it's always going to be the same person using that computer that mobile phone as well that device that eventually everything the car the, you know everything you cannot trust you know the person who logged in uh forever and you need to verify them constantly and actually it says you need to verify them all the time continuously you, you should never stop verifying them that's what zero trust says. And, and it's not only people, applications, data, networks, everything, cloud, you know, cloud endpoint, everything needs to be verified. And one of the things, and I, I would say the more impo most important one is the actual users. Who's using the application? Who's using the computer? Who's actually interacting with that device? And in future, like IoT sort of future and meta future and everything, like we will interact with so many smart devices and so many smart things, you know, our car, our home, Everything. Like imagine you you step in your car, right? If it's not your car, it should not start. It should not start. It should not let, let you drive it. Imagine in a few. Now we're thinking like we're buying cars. Uh, the, the cars are either we buy them, we can rent. But but there's many many companies that that, that now want to make cars uh, very affordable through renting, through paying uh, month by month. So if I rent a car from 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 a company like that instead of buying it, and if that become if that becomes um, the mainstream way of using cars then all of a sudden that company will use my potential risk to assess whether i will crash the car or do whatever damage to other people and so forth now if i allow other people to to use that car all of a sudden it's not i'm not only risking my insurance but i risk other people's lives and so forth and that company can be sued and so forth so the point is if you change a little bit the power the cars should authenticate us all the time and and phones should do that, and, and and computers should do that. And our house, when you 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 go in a house, you open the door. The fact you left uh, that door open should not be a uh, should not be uh, uh, you know open forever. So every every time you want to enter, you should be authenticated and so forth. And this is called continuous endpoint authentication. We kind of invented this term, but this is this is what it should be called. Um, that you want to verify uh, who's using that endpoint every single time, all the time as long as that endpoint is used. And that's 
that's what we're doing and that's part of the zero trust uh, framework the zero trust um, you know in general is you want to verify the user after login every single time you 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 have any suspicion and you should have you should have every uh, a suspicion every single time that person does anything Th that was a great analogy in simple terms i i so th the thing is basically that okay in the physical world you can contain stuff once you go into digital it's it's open to to anything and uh, in time from uh, what what i get digital markers any type of digital markers will make up our digital identity and that will be the the thing that uh, you know can can verify and be able to to make zero trust actually work and and at that point w what i got from other discussions and discussions and whatever i talk with uh, with other people in the tech industry and not necessarily only only in tech is okay but how do we protect that uh, identity so it stays only with you you know how do i have control over the, my identity when it's made up of everything that uh, basically can uh, understand me it's uh it's not that complicated is uh as a concept is something that we it's um it's so simple that we we ignore mm. so when you meet somebody uh in person uh, we're talking like philosophical theory behind this behind the, you know, the whole identity thing right when you meet somebody in person you meet your mom okay mm -hmm. how many times your mom asks you for a password or like your day of birth or anything like that to, to make sure it's you who, who she's talking to like no you know never she she will never do that right or or whatever i mean i'm, I'm using I, I don't know maybe you don't meet with your mom or you don't have good relations but i hope you do uh, it, yeah. it, it's it's an example okay yeah. well my point is um in real world we do authentication even animals do authentication without thinking of hey we're doing authentication we're doing zero trust authentication here but you know in real world if you would have uh, the ability to swap places like you do in digital world. And if somebody can be online or that, you will always like try to check, you know, whether it's, is this the same person I'm talking to? Is this the same person that I that I talked with like, uh, you know, an hour ago or a, a day ago or anything like that, or a second ago? That's the problem. That's that's the thing with zero trust. So you cannot trust the person even, you know, you know, I if somebody could interfere with that communication, could interfere with that, you know, browsing experience, could interfere with that computer, you know, very very fast we're actually checking the checking the device every 10 seconds some some zero trust technologies check uh, a user every five minutes or they may uh the make the verification expire so that they need it needs to be done again or you have those cookies on a computer uh that once you log into let's say amazon for like the next 30 days you don't need to log in again because uh on the same computer you already have the cookie the cookie says uh, this computer used before Amazon was authenticated, so should be fine. Well, leave that computer in a WeWork and go to the bathroom, and basically that computer, you know, can be accessed by anyone. And with little, little amount of text, you basically you put in an order, you type in there, please leave the package on this address, not that address. You enter a new address, or maybe leave the address, but leave the the, the I don't know the package before um, in front of the door, things like that. You give some instructions there, and then you leave, and then all of a sudden. You bought a thing, maybe very expensive, mm -hmm. from that Amazon account without them even. They think, oh, we can trust this user. This computer bought before. Um, the thing is, that's not zero trust. That's um, closer to zero trust than you know trusting the user in for its entire you know journey. But it's not full zero trust. And the thing is, they don't have to be hundred percent zero trust because what they do is they um, they uh, use risk. So they look at the level of risk and based on the level of risk, you if you buy like, a, I don't know, some, uh, you know, $10 wristband, whatever uh, you buy, it's, it's, it's not important to, you know, verify you with all the factors. You buy in like a MacBook Pro, right? Or something like more expensive or something that you don't use to buy all the time, then why not do more verifications? But the thing is, you do more verifications at that point, you get into something we call in e-commerce cart abutment. So people will just leave the cart, will not buy the product because they asked to go get their phone and, you know, find a code and put a code in and the phone is somewhere else, is locked, is charging, is whatever, it's nighttime and it's in a different room and you wake everybody to, to get the phone. 
all those things. So there's always a, a percentage of card abandonment or churn, if you want, when you ask for 2FA for any additional, mm -hmm. uh, you know, measures to verify the user in, a, in an application. But this can happen everywhere, right? So the way we're doing is we're doing it passively. And that's that's actually pure zero trust is passive. It's basically you don't have to do anything. You just go go by you know do whatever you you do. You you buy stuff. You you know uh, check different check email. You know send messages. Do whatever you want. We just watch you from you know the background. We I mean the application watch you yeah. in the background. Actually it happens only on the computer. It doesn't send any data on the cloud. This uh, you know continuous authentication technology for example. And if somebody else just locks the computer. That's it. And um, so it, it instead of, you know, adding friction to your experience, it removes friction, but it adds security. And this is something we'll, we'll start to see everywhere. And that's what uh, China, China is doing with face recognition everywhere. So basically, you don't know, you just like go into places and you're being verified. If it's, if it's not somebody who should have access in just like a building and you're going there, like all of a sudden, like, you know, you'll see if you, a few people, you know, uh, you know, addressing you. Hey, what are you doing here? You should not be here. Yeah. Or you know what I mean. So it's um, you don't see this type of security. You don't see, but it happens everywhere and happens all the time. So this is zero trust. Zero trust. You don't. Sh you you should not see. But the first step into pure zero trust that is passive, is super annoying, active friction based uh, authentication all the time when you do and when the application does everything needs to be verified and a lot of times you will be asked to like put in your finger if you have an iphone and you buy stuff from apple store you know all the time you're being asked to do face recognition or whatever you know put your fingerprint uh finger on or put in a code every like few minutes to make sure it's yourself when you buy certain things of certain um I mean, you can do that, deactivate that, but that's the default. And uh, eventually we will lose that. We continue authentication, the device will always know it's you on the device. So we'll not, you'll not need to, you know, to do all that. And that's, um, that's like zero trust in a, in a pure and, 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 and frictionless form. And I'm curious with any new technology, with any innovation, there is an early phase in which adoption is trickier there is friction in adoption because it's new it needs to be integrated in the way we did things like in this case uh in the case of typing biometrics and its applications what are the main blockers or the main challenges in uh, this adoption i uh, i agree it's a, it's a so adoption curve um and um you know applies to security as well so uh, cyber security and um you have the crossing the cusp um you know uh Mm -hmm. sort of paradigm where you need to be interested at the, at the beginning to like early adopters and then to the you know to tap into a certain field niche and then go to like majority and so forth it's the theory popularized by um by crossing the cost uh, um i forgot the author anyway the um uh, uh, more i think it's uh more something uh, yeah, anyway. I think so. I think so. So, um, the point the the point is in cybersecurity we have something that we uh, risks, and the risks are more important than you know a lot of times than the actual you know adoption curve, uh, and 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 you just even if you're like a lagger or like the late majority. Uh, you will very fast jump um, on the on the on ship mm. and start using a technology that would limit risk because you have large risks. Actually, the reason why majority and actually that 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 deals everything. And, and I'll give you an example. But the, the reason why majority and late majority then in an adoption curve will come last. The reason why they do that is because they don't want to take risks. They actually. High, highly, uh, um, you know, responsive to risk. They say, "Oh, this is a risk. It's a new technology can bring us a lot of uh, a lot of risk. So we should, you know, not use this new technology. We should not install this new application. We should not use this um, approach. Whatever. 
Now, zero you can say zero trust is the same thing. So these companies will say, oh, it's a risk to use zero trust. Let's not use zero trust. Let's accept more risk so that we don't take this risk. And if you look at it, it's it's no risk. It's like having another lock on your door or another 10 locks on your door will not increase risk, but just decrease risk by you know any means. So when you understand that zero trust is actually verifying more, not less, and you actually not take anything from the equation, you just add and you just verify more. It's just cost. There's no risk. And the big companies don't have a cost problem. They have a risk problem. And here's an explanation why this works. And 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 think for yourself and, and the audience can think for, for themselves. When the pandemic hit, how soon everybody was wearing a mask, including vast majority? They were not early adopters. Like, oh, um, I'm early adopter. I like innovation. I will just wear this mask, um, you know, because, uh, you know, I think it's cool. No, but at the beginning, I mean, at the end, like people saw, oh, okay, you know, ma mask is not really that mandatory. I've seen people infected. I infected my, I, I got infected myself. Didn't get the, you know, really bad COVID. So maybe the mask is not needed. But at the beginning, like everybody was like, what do we do? What do we do? Like we wash hands, we wear gloves, we put on masks. When you know vaccine that was not tested, people were ready to take it twice or boosted and all that without being tested enough. I mean, you know, ten years ago, five years ago, we would not even you know get such a vaccine you know for a dog, whatever. For, for and now we're doing it like it's without uh, much uh, much thinking because the risk involved is super high. And, and, and it's an explanation, maybe it's not the right, uh, the mm -hmm. perfect analogy, but it's an explanation why when the risk is high, early adoption is not really that important. Yeah, I mean, the, the risk is at its highest level when we are talking about the pandemic and about uh, people dying. And from what I saw last time, I think there was 10% death rate for the whole, uh, I mean, that's that's pretty huge. Although we do not under we do not feel it as so right now because there are may maybe other geopolitical issues that uh, are at the front page, but it's quite high. Like sixty million people died out of six hundred million that were in. I, I I agree, but there's risk and there's perceived risk. And uh, the thing is, uh, when uh, with regular population, with everybody, um, you know, you know. Uh, roaming around and seeing other people not wearing masks, they think, you know what, that is not, not a big risk. Now, when we're talking cybersecurity and we're talking big co companies that are like the vast majority, like the companies that were never like install an innovative technology before the small ones do first, right? That thing is reverse. So I'm talking about this type of, uh, mm -hmm. of go or government, like big government, like US government, all that, that, that would take like years to sell to a government like this, okay? So now all of a sudden you, 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 uh, invent a technology that would just like make them invincible versus another army or whatever not invincible but uh, not to to be able to conquer or to attack or anything but to resist an attack better right to reduce risk they will not take four years to buy they will they, they will buy instantly they will, they will not wait for like small ones to buy first right they will do their own review but they will move fast because the point is the very reason for why it took so long to to buy at the very beginning was risk and now that is uh that is um that very the very thing that makes them buy something uh new so if you're reducing risk and actually there's um there's there's books and and, and articles mm -hmm. and a lot of information you can read about this so adoption curves applies to almost anything other than um, than risks, when you have like uh, and especially and risk needs to be a certain level. If if risks perceived are over a certain level, certain level, then all of a sudden they become the uh, adoption metric, the adoption um, driver. Yeah, and when it so happens re in reverse. Everything that we learn from uh, Geoff Moore, I think it's uh, yeah. it's the, the author of of Crossing the Cosmos. Everything gets it happens in reverse. Big companies are are, are doing it for are are you know, installing it for, use, using it for, and then last comp, the small companies can't afford, and even if they're early adopters, they're just like, um, they, they don't even have a motivation to do it because already comp, large companies do it. And they when, uh, because they're early adopters, they only look at things that large companies are not doing, government is not doing, they want to do something like uh, different and so forth. So it's it, it's reversed. Yeah, so when, it's bi when the pain is big enough that it becomes a risk of not acting it's it just turns around and in your case 
where uh, are you at on the on on this adoption curve or how do you see the adoption curve in your case in uh, typing by biometrics i think the zero trust is, is a very new concept mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of companies don't yet understand the risk so that's why i said about the the risk and the perceived risk the risk is super high the perceived risk is not yet so high and a lot of companies treat it as a commodity or like as a nice to have is um do we want this technology whatever security is, put put any security technology there and say do we need this mm -hmm. and a cfo would ask or a ceo would ask a chief information officer or a cso mm -hmm. if you want and we'll ask do we really need this and they're like yes we need it we have people working remotely we have this type of uh, risk we definitely need to protect against it and it's like and there's a, okay uh what about the competition are they up to date with this thing or they they still have the same problem and they're like they're not up to date like nobody's up to date it's something super new probably they will have this like next year or something like that okay then we can wait too it's like uh business people have a way of dealing with risk that a lot of times just um they would just take that risk and and fly with it and uh you know tech, technology people and security people understand that uh they're putting the entire company at risk and uh they will never do that they will never like they always like go and and tell the ceos and the cfos and all that look you need to do this you need to do that and they're usually ignoring this advice and uh actually now uh you've seen with i don't know if you you've seen the last breaches that happened in, in the last month so for example we have twitter that um has huge security breaches. Basically, uh, most of their most of their source code, uh, but also data, customer data, a lot of things, are accessible by most people, most employees in their company, mm -hmm. in the company. And those people take the computers everywhere. And those computers, some of them were breached. Some of them uh, had also those spyware installed on them in intentionally by, by people. Now, we already know this. This, this is public. Like the last two weeks or, or so, a lot of information about it uh, came up, uh, came out um, to light. And uh, there is information that actually this, uh, there are security people in the company that went to the chiefs, the chief executive, the chief information, to Jack Dorsey, to their CEO, founder, and all that. Every, everybody, you know, uh, involved at the higher level in the business and told them, look, we have this risk. We need to solve them and all that. And they silenced them. And we already know. And this is with Twitter. We, we can talk about Facebook. We can talk about, you know, many, many other companies there. Uh, so security people are being silenced by business people about risk the organization face uh, is facing. And um, a lot of these companies are public companies. There, there are definitely things that, you know, are not okay. And um, I'm not sure if you heard the recent example of last password, like basically. The, yeah, last, last password, yeah. Yeah. And they're basically like the the main value proposition they they come with is the fact that uh, you can trust me multiple you know keys that you have with them and they actually got uh, got got into a vulnerable situation <laughs> yeah they they were hacked recently yeah and uh, it's a it's an attack that uh, a lot of companies were uh, caught into that type of attack we now call it the uh, twilio hack uh, basically, it, it is a type of phishing that happened to a number of of, uh, of companies now. LastPass, Octa, there's uh, there's a number of them um, that that had the same type of uh, hack happen to them. Uh, maybe in some situations is exactly related to exactly the same hackers. And uh, at this point, there's no uh, clear indication how many companies were breached, but there is like all the big names are there. Uh, they were attacked at least. There's um, um, one case i think of company that was able to protect against that type of attack but the thing is these attacks are aimed at employees so employees that are low-key that are, mm -hmm. they don't even understand they don't know what it means when you get an email from the company saying you need to log in here put in your password do whatever they just comply and they didn't log into the right you know, they didn't click on the, the url they clicked on it's not exactly what it says. It, it, you know, instead of a dot, it has a, you know, a dash. You know, instead of a dash, it has a 
dog and, and so forth so it's just looked almost almost exactly like it should it was a different link took different in a different place and that link was built a year ago and th those links like hundreds of links so this is a concentrated attack that took more than a year to make so the vulnerability the idea the social engineering aspect of it was already planned and um capable to be launched a year ago so they worked on even more than that for sure right but and they were planning this we knew that this type of risk exists and we did nothing that's that's the thing and we're connecting with what i said earlier so yeah. there there's many many risks that cso's and uh, cios they all say look People are working remotely. This is a big issue. You should not leave computers unattended. You should not leave computers, you know, you know, to protocol, to the fact that we train that employee. You train them to do what? And what happens if that computer uh, is breached? You fire, uh, you fire that employee, right? But what if the customer data is involved? What if the, you know, there's a key? There's, a, you know, uh, in cases like Twilio and LastPass, as you said, these are not just you know the if you breach this type of company you breach their clients as well like this this could be like also with like google and microsoft and amazon like you don't you're not just making damage to themselves you're making damage to the whole ecosystem or twitter as well so th that's why this is so important these are platforms these are not these are not just you know it's like it's not like you know you know breaking in somebody's vault where they have money, only money. They have data from other vaults and so forth. And that everything is connected to everything. You, the hacks that happen, Twilio, Cisco, um, Twitter, as I, as I told you, has big issues. Um, LastPass, Okta, these are authentication companies, most of them, are, or they, in their vaults, is not gold, is keys to all the other vaults where there's gold. It's crazy. It's crazy the level of, of 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 breaches that are happening. This is only August this year, all these all these hacks, July and August. So what I think is that what's happening right now it's uh, the fact that we're actually moving towards a tipping point. And what that tipping point is is the fact that the rate of occurrence of this type of cases of phishing, phishing, uh, uh, hackings, when crime moves slowly into the cyber world from the real world and uh, the risk of not taking action and protecting yourself becomes bigger and bigger and i think we're reaching that we, we are slowly reaching that because the interdependency between uh, between platforms and ecosystems is also getting bigger and bigger so when we reach that tipping point it's exactly what you said what you were saying like in like it's it becomes an urgency l like that yeah, and there is a number of things, not only security that, that works that way. And it's very interesting. There are a number of things. So for example, cost reducing has almost the same effect. It doesn't need, it doesn't go by the regular adoption curve. So if, if you're able to reduce cost a lot through a certain type of automation, let's say, it will move much, very, very fast from, maybe there are a few early adopters who understand this, but then we move very, very fast to the to the majority because the majority has the biggest, um, you know, um, incentive there. Mm -hmm. They will win most if they reduce cost. Or if you're talking about, you know, weapons, right, of 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 war, you know, there's no even if you have enough money, there's no uh, reason for a personal, you know, for an individual to buy a certain I don't know rocket launcher. It's only like big government that can buy that. Not even small government, small companies, a small country's government. So it's some things are counter uh, counter in, in intuitive and that don't work on the on the regular you yeah. know adoption curve. Yeah. And so risk is uh, is is one thing that you know enables a different type of adoption uh, automation or uh, cost reduction um, enables enables uh, you know similar things. I think you know anything that would um, increase sales by margin. That if you're able to sell with a multiplier, that will be very very fast adopted by large com companies. Yeah. Which is because that that's really they're looking at anything that can multiply the revenues, 
were small small companies that just wanted to validate, you know, new product, market fit, things like that. So early adoption, early adoption there is just is it's it's doing a different thing. They're validating, they're helping, you know, you know, brand branding and messaging and getting it out there and making other companies and, and government, whatever clients learn about that technology, all, all that. When you're already at that point, you're super big. At that point, you don't want none of these first ones. You want, you know, any acceleration you can get at that point, any multiplication you can get, any uh, growth you can get. And then if you have any secret that you can buy to grow, that's when you want. And that, those uh, are not early adopters. Uh, mm -hmm. like, there are the majority. They will only uh, use certain technologies and things only if the rest of the industry does. But they need to do to do that because um, it will just it will just make them more powerful. And um, you know, powerful people want to be more powerful. That's yeah, uh, yeah. Just so we can touch on this point as well, like a day in the future, <laughs> because we were discussing about future of work, and uh, you know how can we trust each other in that uh, future of work? If you were to think about, I don't know, like long term future. And uh, typing DNA wouldn't be there, or the typing biometrics wouldn't be there in that future. And then it appears, like it appears. How does it change that future? And if you can take me through how zero trust can actually, uh, you know, build that trust for people and organizations and between individuals. Well, I think it's. Uh... Everything is changing. Hybrid work is here to stay. Uh, there's definitely some companies who are making a case of, you know, returning to the office mandatory five days a week. Um, they have a say because some of their employees really can't work anywhere else. So we're talking about, you know, finance. There's some that you really don't have that many options. And um, even like you know, companies like JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, you know, forcing everybody to go back to the offices, they have this upper hand at this point. And also there's this, um, I think everybody like set up uh, at this point to like fire about 10, 20% of their, their workforce. That's that's what's happening right now in US. Like every tech companies, you know, especially, but also these other companies, they, they're just reducing burn because they want their numbers to look good. Um, especially for like next uh, quarters and all that, so that um, their value will not decrease. So at this point, it's just how to survive this type of theme, uh, times. And um, that's one of the ways. So it's much easier to say, um, we want everybody to come back to the office and say, you, 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 you let, you're being let go. And whoever doesn't want to, because they already moved out of the city because they, whatever. They don't want to because they realize, hey, I can actually work for another empl employer and work from home or partly from home or two days from home, whatever. And um, they're okay with that. But um, if talent would be uh, a big problem, I, I don't think they would go with this, uh, you know, full speed ahead. And, and there's only a few companies. I think tech companies will not be able to force this. Maybe like companies like Google, because uh, I don't know, from the outside, you see a lot of scrutiny around Google and all that. But um, from the inside, and if you're like a top developer, it's one of the top three companies or top few companies you want to work at. It's uh, people pride themselves, uh, you know, that they were able to even, you know, get a job at Google. It's uh, it's not like uh, you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go work for like a startup or whatever. Uh, yeah, there's there's many many people that do that after they work at google but um uh companies like google but uh, there, there's others but uh, the idea is um maybe them can force people back in the office to a certain extent mm -hmm. but also people working at google have options so i think um at this point there's no way back so regarding of you know this hybrid thing and and if and, and it all starts with that if that's true then what we're saying is that you drive in the airport. You're not driving in the parking of the airport. You're driving over TSA. That's what we enabled. We enabled you to go directly, not to the gate, to the actual, you know, airplane door. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So we just yeah. skipped the whole entire thing. So zero trust 
It's not an option. That's what a lot of companies don't understand. Zero trust is a an approach, and it's not even a technology. It's an approach. It's multiple technologies. You need that um, in place, and it's not right way to do it. There's not one single player in the space. There's not one single um, approach that works 100%. Zero trust doesn't work 100%. There's always some risk that will not be 100% uh, covered, and it's fine. It's better to be covered to a certain degree than not at all. And then there's also this, um, there's this joke that uh, uh, two guys were in a forest and uh, they, they one, one of them saw um, a bear and the bear started uh, running towards them. And, and one of the two guys, you know, um, sat down, took off his backpack and uh, took out, took out uh, his pair of sneakers because he was like wearing sandals or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the other guy was like, uh, look, whatever you're doing is not going to work because you're not going to outrun the bear. And and this guy turns back and it's it's, it's, it's a popular joke. This guy turns around and say, says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, it's uh, oftentimes we don't realize that cyber is exactly the same thing. Um, when we're talking, cyber crime is very rarely that targeted at, you know, government and, you know, information level that, hey, somebody really wants that information from government. Um, uh, that In that case, yeah, you, it's the next level. You, being targeted directly is not is not going to be you're running fast faster than the you know your competitor you're gonna you're gonna you know survive no in that case if you're targeted directed uh directly you, you you you're gonna be hit in a way or another so uh, that's a different thing but in corporate uh world security um and cybercrime are different things uh you know cyber criminals hackers and all that they will go after the lowest hanging fruit will never go after the hardest to hit why would we do that? So nobody wants to, you know, spend, you know, immense amount of time to try to, you know, hack a certain type of, you know, user or their company that is really well protected. They will go for long, uh, lowest hanging fruit. It's easier. There's so many companies out there. Why do you want to hack, I don't know, into, you name it. I don't know, mm -hmm. the one company, right? So, uh, and and what amazes me is not only that um, with these last breaches that happened last uh, few weeks is that companies that are so uh, high on a security uh, you know chain got breached. That tells me that it's not that we're not running you know faster than the brick and mortar companies and all you know that like we're running super slow i mean if companies like this are running so slow that they can breach so easily then we don't even need sneakers at this point we need sandals i think we we're like uh barefoot at this point it's it's, it's it, it, so at this point anything counts 2fa everybody should just install 2fa it regardless what 2fa is better than nothing yeah the the tipping point is close that's what i believe <laughs> the tipping point is close yeah, so the idea is, and now with the remote working, everything like changed so much that we really need, really need new approach. And um, the new approach is zero trust. And even if you don't do everything, you start, you need to start to do some of the some of the things uh, in uh, in that makes sense in a zero trust approach. So just one more question on, on this on a day in the future, for an individual, for a normal individual that works in an organization, let's say. What would a usual day look like or how would it change due to the benefits of uh, zero trust, of uh, these types of technologies that enable zero trust? Would it change in any way? And if so, how? Well, the day itself, I don't think it changes. It's just, um, yeah, the way, uh, the way it's seen maybe by the user, the fact that... Uh, the user knows that um, they're being uh, protected all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they're being watched all the time in a way. It's like when you're policing somebody who needs to wear the seatbelt and they're not doing that, and you can tell. And 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 if, if that thing actually can make them actually be more productive. So all in all, you know, having an eye on your computer, which is the corporate computer, is not. Is not the employee computer. It's a good thing. 
Now, there is also so trends where, which I don't agree with. Um, so companies not only like watching whatever you have on a screen, which is kind of okay, let's say, but uh, you need to know that. Yeah. It's not going to be personal stuff. So, and ideally, you will not use com corporate computers for personal stuff. But uh, a lot of companies, what they're doing now, just to make sure that, you know, whoever is actually, these are some of our clients now. So companies want to make sure that the person working on the, the other end of the computer is the actual person they hired. It's not somebody else because uh, you hire a, you know, top level professional for some, you know, some job and they allow other persons to see that the computer just move around the mouse, you know, type in some code from a paper, or whatever. And then at the end, you will just erase everything and you are smart in two hours. You do, you do what, uh, you know, the company thinks you do in eight hours. Happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But what these companies are doing to prevent that, they film, they they have the camera, they 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 turn the camera on the entire day and they film everything in front of the camera. And it turns out that actually there's a judge ruling, uh, ruling now that says uh, it's illegal. Because basically you have you have a view into that person's private property. Yep. His house or her house. And uh, you should not you should not be able to look into the private property. The computer is company property. That's totally fine. You look at whatever that person input in the computer has in the computer and all that. But watching that person and watching the environment, you know, should be something that is um, needs user consent. And the and 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 the user may de decline. And maybe there's other people behind him. And normally we need that person consent and so forth. Uh, to be filmed and so forth and stored and all that. So, and the thing is, these companies are trying to figure out how to, you know, always continuously sort of, um, you know, reduce risk mm -hmm. and know who's using the computer, who's interacting with client data, maybe who's interacting with very sensitive data. And you need to know that. But the way to do that, um, the ways to do that are not all um, equal and are not uh, not created equal or not... Um, uh, equ equitable you you cannot use all, any matter measures just uh, and 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 just because you need you need that uh, knowledge so Reliance has this uh you know three key three key thing attached to it you don't you you cannot use all the time surveillance just because you uh you suspect something so uh, the default of not trusting anyone in the first place it's correct for zero trust approach it's not correct for interhuman relations you have to start with trusting the other right the the benefit of doubt and all that so you're not starting with hey i don't trust you first you have to prove me uh you know wrong that i, I should trust you and all that and before you I actually we actually do something together that's that's the zero trust approach um uh you know, way of way of thinking, way of doing things, but not 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 how we should. And you know, so surve doing surveillance of everyone is really not something we should go for. Yep, yep. So, what can we do, like each one of us individually, in order to adopt it at uh, a better moment, like in time? It's a very good question. I think uh, it's a, it's a really really good question. So the problem with this working from home, uh, I uh, let's summarize it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is the problem that nobody can trust you as an employee, and you as an employer you cannot trust the employee, even if they're trustable. Mm -hmm. You cannot mm -hmm. trust because you don't have the right metrics. So you need to look into some of it, not everything, some of it, and you need transparency from the employer employee. Mm -hmm. There's no other way the employee needs to work hand in hand with the employer and understand that that trust is not something that is given for free and that needs to be verified all the time do i still trust this person so last last month he did a really good job and i have his performance metrics but this month he did a very poor job do we fire this person let's look into more data do we do does this person have their you know a good arg good argument why his performance was lower or maybe mm -hmm. we didn't understand things and so forth about his performance things like that and um you need this sort of transparency in the way you measure performance and the way you me measure you know authenticate the people and all that uh, um, you know make sure they're not cheating they're not uh you know doing any sort of fraud uh, you know corporate fraud 
uh, that would uh, compromise the company and so forth. So there's need, uh, there's a need for transparency on the other end. You want to work from home, fine, but you need to have some sort of transparency that you agree with. I, I fully agree with it. Okay, thank you. It was it was a long and insightful conversation. Thank you very much for for staying this long. Uh, it was great to have you today, and I'm really looking forward to meet again and discuss some more. Thank you, Raul. It was great having you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.